I know you've probably already seen a bunch of videos by now all talking about this same topic. And I agree. I've also watched those same videos. And since I've done that, I want to go ahead and take this time and make my own video on this discussion and put my two cents in because I think most of what everyone is saying is pretty spot on. However, I think there is a little bit more to it that no one's really talking about, and that's what I want to talk about. So of course, the whole thing we have going on here is we have racetracks closing everywhere. We're not just talking about drag racing tracks, we're talking about circle tracks, oval tracks, circuit tracks, all kinds of motorsports tracks are closing across the country like crazy. It's like one after another dropping like flies and especially when it comes to drag racing just recently you know we have the closure of this track and 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 you get the point there's a lot of tracks closed in just recent time it's kind of crazy because yeah it's it's setting this fire under the automotive community and everyone's now getting worried about what this means for the future of racing. I don't really want to dive into that. I don't think it's going to affect it too much long term, and I'll, I'll explain that why. The tracks that have closed, they're just a victim of circumstance. The circumstance happens to be economics, and that's kind of the big part of all of this. I mean, let's be real. The biggest hurdle that these racetracks have to overcome, and even smaller, the smaller circle tracks, you know, your local town tracks, they're the ones that are in the biggest trouble. Why? Because they have to overcome the biggest hurdles. Operating these tracks is not cheap. So many videos have covered this already, you know, just as a business standpoint, running a racetrack is a horrible, horrible business. It is not a good business at all to be in. And really the only reason you have these successful tracks is because they have done a lot to keep themselves in the spotlight, to keep themselves relevant, to keep themselves making money and keeping people coming through the door. It's a lot of work. If you've ever been to any of these tracks, you see the type of machines and stuff it takes to keep the facilities in good shape, to keep the surface of the tracks in good shape. Some of these facilities are huge. They have a lot of people who work for them for the events. Some of the events they have are big. And with the cost of everything going up, you know, the wages are going up, cost of insurance has gone up, property taxes are going up and up and up, depending on where you live, they are going through the roof. Then you got the other side of it where you're doing everything you can. You have to raise your costs to support your business as it was, and then you have to basically raise your admission costs, the costs that you're charging people to come in to use your facility. So if it's a spectator, instead of paying $10, you're paying $20. If you're a racer on a test and two night, instead of paying $25, you're paying $45. From a business standpoint, running these racetracks is horrible. And it's not easy. So I can understand why these local tracks all over the place are closing. Now with that, some of the tracks that have closed in recent time aren't just local tracks. They're, they're pretty big, well-known tracks, being big facilities. They're just not backwoods tracks, you know? They're big facilities that have been around for 30, 40, 50 years. So why is that? Once again, I think it still boils down to the economics of things. You know, ever since coming through the last few years as society has bounced back into whatever position it happens to be in, obviously inflation has just ultimately royally screwed so much. I mean, small businesses are hanging on by threads now if they can hang on at all, if they haven't already closed. I mean, that's just any type of business, not just related to racing. The problem is when you're talking about a racetrack, the average Joe now has less money that they can put in their pocket, right? They're probably not gonna be going out every weekend and racing their cars like they were. I'm not saying that doesn't happen. I'm not saying it stops people, but I'm sure that it has contributed to some of the flow to some of these tracks. Not to mention at this point in time, if you are a track owner and you are you know, sinking ship and if someone comes in and offers you some large sum of money 
to get out of all of your headaches, get out of the property, the business, and you go enjoy life. Yeah, I'm sure they're just like, you know what? These last few years have been ridiculous. I'm going to go ahead. I'm taking that money. I'm running. YOLO. You know, <laughs> like they're not going to sit there and kill themselves trying to keep these facilities afloat. And honestly, I don't blame them. I wouldn't want someone to do that. It's a bad time economically for a lot of different industries. It's just even more so for racing. And I think that is a good way to bring this into another part of the discussion. But before I get to that point, I want to kind of touch on a couple small little details first about why these big facilities are being sold. Obviously, the bigger the facility, the more land it's on. And land values now are getting pretty high. You know, the cost of land is going up significantly in a lot of different areas, especially as more areas develop. Yeah. The cost of land is getting ridiculous. I've been keeping an eye on things here in my areas of Florida. Three, four years ago, an acre of land would have been maybe, you know, $1,000 or, or $2,000, maybe. Now that same acre of land, six, seven, eight thousand dollars $8,000. You see what's happening here, and it's happening everywhere. All this makes you wonder if it's happening purposely. So. The reason why I say that is we all know that the current presidential administration is very, very keen, at least from what they like to say, uh, on environmental protection, you know, reducing emissions, pro EVs, trying to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels and petroleum powered vehicles and whatnot. And these private owned facilities, they're one of the very few ways you can run a highly modified vehicle with no emission system <laughs> legally especially if you're in a highly emissions compliant state. These are the only ways you can get around the law legally is to run it at these facilities. It is off the road, right? Because you're on private property, you're off the public road. And well, I guess if you are a, you know, huge environmental activist nut job, you would probably start attacking these facilities because they're big polluters, right? This is just kind of a thought I have going on here. Maybe there's some invested interest or maybe there is a purposely designed plan to come in and shut these tracks down by offering them an amount of money they can't refuse because it's kind of been happening all over um, in terms of property. I was reading that long ago, first time home buyers were getting outbid almost all the time by some other person. Come to find out a lot of those other bidders were Property management companies usually all come under these big, big corporate, you know, giants. Uh, there are a few names I don't want to say because it will probably trip off the algorithm. And I like to stay on YouTube's good side. So, but if you know, you know. And the sad part is if that's happening in the residential side of things, I'm sure it's happening in the commercial side of things. You know, commercial properties are probably also getting outbid and stuff and people who are in sitting on property like that, you know, they probably are being offered ungodly amounts of money for their property. <laughs> the land's worth more than the business that operates on the land. I almost feel like there may be some type of initiative, designed initiative to come in, hand out tens of millions of dollars, close these facilities down. It's a win for the environmentalist, right? You know, no more polluting tracks and they can do whatever they want with the property because when it comes to real estate, the whole thing is any piece of property is always going to be looked at its best possible use. It's all because of the money. Money makes the world go around, sadly. There's just that little bit of a, a thought that has been bouncing in the back of my head, not saying that that is actually a thing, but hey. But moving on to that, uh, let's see, racing. Racing is expensive. I haven't started yet. And when I do get to that point, maybe, I'm not even sure if I'll continue because the way things are, uh, obviously I bought my Fiero to go racing. Racing competitively versus just going to a test and tune and running your car down the track are two different things completely. The average Joe can afford to take their car down the track on a test and tune night or like a locals night only, you know, like a street night or something. Um, you know, generally you got a 20 to $60 admission fee, but if you wanted to race competitively, 
that $60 admission fee is butt wiping money compared to what you have to spend to race legally. And that is all due to this right here, the NHRA. Just like most governing bodies of anything, they get way too involved. Unfortunately, the involvement makes things a lot more challenging. So what I mean by that? Now, I understand that a lot of changes and these restrictions and everything are for the safety of those racing. However, I think there's to some extent that a lot of it is unnecessary. This is what I mean by that. Okay, so if you want to race your car in a competitive event, then that's fine. Generally, a lot of your local competitive events, it all varies on what class you're running in. You go below a nine in competitive racing, and then the cost of racing just double just because you went a 9.99, not a 10. That's how bad this is. So if you ever attend any big events, you'll see that a lot of them are sponsored by the NHRA. If your car is faster than a 9.99, depending on the class that you're running in, you're going to likely have to get an NHRA license. You ever seen that? You go down the tracks and they have to do like these weird half runs and full runs. You'll hear them on the announcers. Oh yes, that racer is getting our license, blah, blah, blah. Depending on the series you're doing, depending on uh, how fast your car is capable of, you know, you could be spending $65 to hundreds of dollars on these licensing. You just didn't think it was that complicated. You thought, eh, you know, I'll pay whatever the admission fee is to get in, I go have fun, I go run, I lose, I lose, I win, I win. No, sir. No, so the average guy who wants to get into competitive racing, which is really the, these big events that are feeding the current big tracks, uh, the average guy has to spend a lot of money. This is not something everyone can do. You have to have a lot of money invested to race. So there's another problem. You know, the average person like me, I'm gonna go put parts of my car. Hell, if I'm going to drive an hour out of my way to spend 20, 30, 40, 50, whatever dollars it is to, to run my car and see how it runs after making changes. Oh, hell no. I'm gonna take my broke self out on that road and do the same thing. And that's with everyone. They're not going to go out of their way to these tracks, spend money to do these tests and tunes every now and again. They're going right out on that roadway and they're doing the same thing. These larger events, that's why you always see the same people every year doing the same events. A lot of these racing teams, you know, they, they're they not just one, two people. You know, depending on the, the class that you're running in, you know, you could have a team of 10 people or more and the car, the team, everything is being funded by someone else or maybe a group effort. You have, you know, everyone put, putting money in to do it. You got sponsors on your cars to reduce the cost to keep them running. It ain't cheap. It ain't cheap to run a race car. It ain't cheap to go racing. So you can see how this is affecting smaller tracks. They're not going to stay open. And another good point, I see someone made tracks in the Northeast where, you know, where I come from. They have to close down during the winter time. Uh, one of the big tracks where I came from, Cecil County Driveway, they would be open depending on weather. They would probably, they would usually reopen around March, usually like towards the middle end of March. They would stay open pretty much all the way until early December. They would stay open as long as they could. Once you get into those later months, it gets so cold some nights that you cannot run. And a lot of these tracks operate at night on the weekends so yeah, you, you can see you got a few days a week for a few hours of those days um, that a handful of people are gonna show up and, and support your track. It's no surprise that these tracks are closing. It's just not a good business model. The only reason these bigger tracks are staying open and these larger facilities is because uh, you know they're either funded by other sources uh, such as sponsors or maybe corporate interests, bigger privately owned tracks. Let's say something like we have down here in Florida, the Bradenton Motorsports Park, and those tracks are staying alive because their ties to social media and a lot of big YouTubers and whatnot who are currently very relevant in the younger automotive community going there and then racing. That's why those tracks are doing really well. You know, they've 
kind of move along with the times um, and they host huge events. And of course, here in Florida, these tracks can stay open all year round and run all year round. Tracks should be thriving, but I'm sure that managing a track is not easy. And if you didn't get with the times, you're probably gonna fail. And sadly, I think a lot of the tracks that have closed have been under the operation and the ownership of the same people for a lot of time. You know, we're talking about 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And it's sad to see, I don't think racing is dead. I don't think motorsports is dead. Here in Florida, they're building racetracks. <laughs> they're not closing them down. A few have closed. It's a tough business to be in. And if you don't know how to do it, you're gonna fail. It's a, you know, it's like, like running a restaurant. Same thing, restaurants are tough to run. And unless you know how to operate a restaurant, you're likely not gonna be open long. So I think that's what happens with a lot of these racetracks. They, you know, they close down, someone comes in, takes them over. They think they're gonna do well, they see how tough it is. And then, you know, three, four years later, same thing, closes back down. But with that said comes the final thing here. And I think this is why a lot of tracks are being built and staying relevant is because they have to completely change the business model and how they collect revenue to keep these tracks funded and open. Uh, there's a few of them, but one in particular is called the Motorclave. It's this really cool facility where, and it, it's nothing new, they, these kind of facilities have been around, but it's basically you buy into it, garages slash apartment type things where you can go take your car, keep your cars there, Go spend the night at your apartment thing, go racing anytime you want, like you have priority use of the racetracks. In a way, I think that's a much smarter way of funding these tracks because you gotta think, if you have a racetrack that's cost, I don't know, buy 10 million to build, for example, we're gonna do some rough math here, because this is kind of a new thought I had in my mind. If you, like say you have 10 million invested into that track, but you have, you know, 200 units on the track that you can sell out to people for, I don't know, I think they, they start at like 350, 400,000. Some of them go all the way up to close to a million, I think, depending on the size. Simple math, let's say the average cost of those facilities, half a mil, 500 grand, and you have 200 units, you're making your money back and then some. Honestly, I mean, that's two, that's a hundred million. So if it costs 10 million to build a facility, yeah, so yeah. But you can see how that works. Like you can literally do it that way, sell those units. And those units operate, I think like normal real estate um, where they can be bought and sold. So you always have people coming in and buying and, and using that facility from the initial purchase. And then you know, once you collect all that profit from selling those units, it pays for the land, it pays for the construction of the facility it was built on. Therefore, the operating costs can be kept down over time. And it's just a better, smarter way of doing business. You gotta think these are businesses. At the end of the day, these racetracks are businesses. And that is much, much smarter than offering certain hours of certain days for a certain amount of people to come in and pay a smaller fee to run down the tracks. If these types of tracks are existing where they can operate like this, then there's gotta be other ways that would be a better uh, way of funding these tracks and not in a traditional sense. And I often thought, wow, you know, the big thing now, it's weaseled its way into every one of our lives, subscriptions. Subscriptions to everything. I thought to myself, I wonder if you could apply that same business strategy to a racetrack. I just feel like that there could be more creative uh, ways of running these businesses that might be more profitable um, for, the, for these tracks and would actually probably work better for a lot of people who are not doing well with money. Like, let's say you get a season pass to an amusement park, like freaking season passes. At Universal, it was like, what, 600 some dollars or whatever for a year? I mean, would you, if you're a big, big car guy, if you had a nice big facility that had a bunch of different things to do, would you buy a season pass to that facility <laughs> to be able to use it any day you want it and be able to enjoy it whenever you could without having to pay additional cost? You probably would, wouldn't you? So I think, you know, if, if these facilities can 
come up with different ways, you know, offer season passes. The cool thing about that kind of business model is if someone pays you or the track owner for that subscription, if they don't use it for that month for whatever, well, then that's great because they're getting their money either way. So it keeps the lights on. I don't know. That's just something I've been thinking about. I think until the business model can adapt to the current economic situation and, and our society, tracks are just going to start dropping like they are. And they're going to continue to drop until they adapt. Sadly, I think that's just kind of where it boils down to. And I haven't really heard many people really dive into this part of the whole situation. I thought this would be a good opportunity to put my take, my spin on it. And, you know, I think that will be it. Let me know what you think about my whole take on this whole situation. And, uh, you know, if you have any additional comments you want to make on this whole thing, other than it sucks, we know it sucks. Put them in the comment section. Let's talk about it. Obviously, this is a huge, big discussion. So go ahead and leave that comment, but it's going to wrap it up here for this video. If you liked the video, please give it a thumbs up. Share with everyone you know if you want to see more content like this and you haven't already. Go ahead, subscribe to the channel. Keep a look out for the next Cars Created video.